and playing position was a little like here between your legs and it was dance instrument so it was mostly dance music so Welcome. You have found the Quarenta podcast. 40 minutes of chat around music and Finland. For my first interview, I chose Ilka Henonen. He strikes me as a suited first guest, a proper beginning for the Quarenta podcast. He is a young Finnish musician, best known for his groundbreaking work on performing the Yohiko, an almost forgotten version of the boat lyre. Ilka has a master's in folk music from the Sibelius Academy here at the University of Arts Helsinki and he's currently finishing his doctoral work. And that should be it, right? A Finnish Yohiko researcher. But the minute you think you know Ilka, you get surprised by finding him sitting at the piano, playing the double bass, singing or confidently performing early music with an amazing Baroque ensemble. He feels quite at home, diving deep into philosophy and psychology, trying to comprehend the space within, our emotions and experiences, and their reflections on art practice. On the other hand, he's quite upfront at calling bullshit when he sees it, and analyzing something quite pragmatically when that is the appropriate approach. I know, this should be a proper presentation of my guest and I'm probably failing miserably, but As you have figured by now, Ilka is hard to place. I decided I should just have another of our little chats and see where the conversation led us this time and bring you along for the ride. So come on, let's meet Ilka Heinonen. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure to do this with you and, and thank you for taking the time. Um, I've, for the people that uh, do not know us, uh, we met at the doctoral program in, in Helsinki at the Sibelius Academy, uh, University of the Arts, Helsinki. And you were actually one of the first people that I met. We met in the welcoming party for the doctoral students and, and you came and you spoke with me, which was really nice. And since then, So that was well, special lot. for Finnish people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, since September last, we've been wanting to have a discussion uh, about many, many things in the music world, and we actually never did do so. So, yeah. so I have lots of questions, and I really would like to pick your brain and talk about. Um, the Yohiko and other stuff about Finnish music. So anyways, there's a lot, there's lots about you that I do not know, right? Yeah. I see instruments behind you. So just let us know a little bit. How did it all start for you? Were, were you like six when you started making music? Because you, you, you've not been in the folk world forever. This is something you're doing now. Yeah, it's that's a very hard question to put it quickly on a nutshell. But um, I started playing piano at home, like improvising. I don't know. I was something like four or something like that. But didn't go to any like uh, institutional learning. Only when I was like nine years, I started playing drums and went to this kind of uh, music centered uh, primary school mm. and uh, then I, uh, I I was quite well except going to the drum, les uh, pe drum lessons and playing in big bands I mostly was self learned with the uh, bass and guitar and piano and I sang quite a lot like we started our first rock band 
I think I was 10 or 11. And I think the, 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 my education of music, first education was different like big band, big band projects and the school projects and especially living on the cellars where the bands are playing. So it was just basic rock stuff, but people who have grown up in the, in the chains of 70s and 80s. So they so, somewhere they they have have been playing the basic stuff when they were young, like at when they in the in the beginning of nineties, like Nirvana and Grants and basic seventies rock and this kind of stuff. And that was also my education that we made a, we made rock tunes. Uh, I was singer. I was a drummer. I was a singer drummer and uh, was also. This happening? At the, at the at the beginning of nineties. So you you were born like around the same date 80. as me. Eighty. Yeah, I, I was born born on eighty. Yeah. And uh, uh, I've, I've, and then also like when I was I think I was twelve or thirteen I started learning piano by myself. Hmm. And uh, well, over all, all, all the time was making my uh, own compositions, well, rock, well, tunes, you, you yeah. could say, and words for lyrics for the different bands, and most of all, learning music by heart and uh, by ear, and uh, just for by listening and uh, well, to to to. Um, there were two uh, main issues which somehow followed in my afterlife, uh, in my life after that, was uh, that the whole uh, band scene, like rock band scene, was there was so much about uh, doing your own tunes and uh, improvisation and this kind of collective feel. Yeah. And they're just the similar issues which later on came with the folk music, this kind of new folk music wave. And when I was, I, was, I think I was 14 when I understood that, oh shit, if I want to be a professional musician, I should have like proper, pro, pro, uh, like proper uh, education. So, yeah. so I went to my um, music teacher, with whom I've been working also like outside the school because I was performing in musicals at that time. Also when he was conducting and he said, well, there's, you can play already bass. So come to play double bass mm. in our music school. So I started playing double bass and also like concentrating much deeper on uh, classical music. And I decided, I think I was 15 that, okay, now, I will have to have another route here also. I have this like rock route yeah. and then I have this uh, classical path where I just practiced and practiced double bass. And on that time, I think I was, af uh, I was in my first folk music group when I was 15, mm. but it was much more about folklore stuff. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, then when I was 18... You decided it was more or less a teenager decision that we all have to do at some point. That, well, I could do this with my life, in a sense. Like, for me, it was the visual arts. At one point, I thought it was maybe painting. Maybe it, was, it would be fine arts university. And then in a couple of years, I started deciding, well, maybe as a profession, maybe architecture will suit yeah. me better and yeah and in my late teens music became a thing for the same reasons as you there was someone at school and i started writing some lyrics for like mm. this rock band um yeah but but architecture similar, seemed, yeah. yeah yeah well but architecture at the, at the time seemed like a proper profession and yes. music, not so much. And here we are. But yeah, but yeah. 
that was the same with me that I, I had like, uh, I was very interested about psychology. And uh, that was very like, I was really like struggling that do I concentrate only on psychology or also music. But uh, then I somehow got interested more and more about just concentrating on uh, classical music and double bass playing. I, be, I had been listening, my father is quite a uh, keen music listener that we had quite huge variety of different kind of music, especially mm -hmm. like late, uh, er, late romantic, early modern contemporary music, jazz and also some fusion stuff. And then especially now later on, I was, think, I was thinking that uh, it was easy for me at home to pick Buxtehude or Bach or yeah. Scarlatti, they were there on the shelf, yeah. and I was uh, in one point. I was I was really like dreaming that, oh shit! If I would just followed my mother's hope that my mother's wish that I should start to play piano so I could be a cembalo or organ player when I was fifteen when I started mm -hmm. to learn my uh, keyboard uh, skills. But yeah. Um, yeah, that, 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 I guess it was the decision when you grow up that when you get close to 18 that you think, that, okay, you really have to think what you are going to do. For me, it was, uh, I decided it's not psychology, it's music. Yeah. And the music then, uh, for me, I didn't, nobody told me that at that time that they could be this kind of way of life called freelancer. So, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. And if somebody would have told, I would say that, fuck off. That 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 sounds so scary that I want I want. <laughs> yeah, no, no one told me. Yeah, yeah, go to architecture school. There's no jobs. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and and you'll you'll be an architect in your fifties, hopefully. Um, mm. Yeah, but um, but then you did what? What schools did you go to? It, was it classical? Did you have the classical? Yeah, it was the classical conservatory where I, I yeah. practiced double bass. And uh, then changed to Sibelius Academy 2003 uh, to music education department because I thought that there is, uh, because there was, I wanted to have a new bass teacher. And I thought, hmm, I've been playing other, other instruments quite a lot also. Mm. And I, I, I have had like, uh, I had on, already on that time, I had been doing some uh, primary school music teachings. Okay. So it wasn't, and also because of the psychology, it felt like, hmm, it could be also interesting, but I never thought that I would be a music teacher. Oh, so, uh, so, so it, it wasn't uh, a professional choice. No, no, it, it was, it was more about getting uh, more different kind of musical possibilities. You see. And already then, I had, I was quite deep in the uh, folk music world. And uh, when I was uh, on my second year of uh, music education in the Paris Academy, I think I had more lessons from folk music department than <laughs> from music education. Yeah. And I continued this kind of like uh, two-parted two life quite a long time that in music education I did the uh, pedagogic, pedagogic studies and played jazz and everything, pop, popular music still and practiced double bass. And then uh, on the other hand, I was just concentrating on folk music, Scandinavian folk music, Hungarian, uh, Jewish mm. and uh, also, yeah. So, and then, so so you took a bachelor's and a master's in in uh, I did I did all, I did almost masters of music education but but then I thought oh shit if I do a master I will be a music teacher so I then <laughs> that I did I did the uh, pedagogical um, pedagogical um, I don't know what's it called yeah pedagogical studies and I, I'm allowed to teach yeah this this uh, pedagogical uh, skills uh, or the per permission what's that certificate yes pedagogical yeah. certificate 
but then ch changed to do master in a folk music department. Okay. And uh, I have to go back to uh, to 2000 when I started like b b like my uh, studies in Tampere Conservatory, and there were a few now already quite well known folk musicians studying also there in conservatory, like Alina Järvelä, for example, who is now in the band called Frigg. And uh, with them I started playing quite much of folk music more and get into this not that folkloric stuff, but, but more like this contemporary folk music. And then I was uh, introduced to Jouhikko. So I started my Jouhikko playing at 2000 or 2001, I guess. I was thinking, what the hell? What, what is this strange instrument that it sounds crap and it's very hard to play? It doesn't make any sense. Yes, I want to play this. <laughs> and the, the, the stories keep, I mean, it could be explained by our age. You know, we were born 79, 80, around mm. there. So it's also a generational thing. We were in our 20s, right? Mm. But uh, that's one thing. But some, some guys younger than us also started going into folk music in the very late 90s, beginning of, of the 2000s. You understand what I mean? And, and it's the same in Finland as in Portugal. You think there's, there was something happening? I mean, there always been folk music and as, as, a, as a very traditional way of expressing music, which I don't think we fit in, actually. And I think that's also a generational thing because I, didn't, I never had direct contact with folk music, with traditional music in their traditional set yeah you know i just i i got in contact with it through field recordings and and this contemporary folk that you speak about right which was kind of new also mm, yeah uh so do you think something happened during the beginning of the 2000s around europe that because it's quite spontaneous why should i for me, for you, it was the Ohiko, maybe you saw it somewhere, and for me, it was bagpipes, and I, till this day, I can't explain why. Uh, for me, uh, personally, I think there's, I, I have, I have quite clear, like, memories, what hit me the most. Mm. It was uh, the background of this uh, collective working and collective composing of this kind of, like, uh, rock music and rock music context and the conventions there but I somehow didn't like uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the performer was the, uh, the idea of the artist was somehow I wasn't comfortable with that that it it's it's about the artist it's not that much about the music in rock and then uh, in rock yeah Hmm. somehow and in classical music vice versa it was completely different then it was about the music and hmm. the uh, player in, in itself it's nothing and uh, and I I like love love the music but I didn't like the hierarchic world hmm. the old-fashioned hierarchic world of classic classic classical world so I think, and also then in jazz also, I played quite a lot of jazz in that time, 2000, and also previously and after that. And uh, there was also like this kind of hierarchies, which I always didn't like, but there was about the attitude of the material and the stuff. And then when, like as a double bass player, it was just heaven for me to, to play folk music because I, c I could use the, how to say, classical skills and also the improv improvisational skills from playing jazz and then also the whole convention of doing music was very close to these kind of popular music mm -hmm. conventions. So for me, it was about this kind of, his my personal history 
was somehow very co connected with this new new folk movement. I see. But uh, what because uh, it can be that uh, it was about the whole globalization going on like with a bigger pace on that that moment. The world music had been there already quite a long time, yeah. and also this kind of new trad for new folk music has settled quite well to the culture, and it started to create yeah. like this kind of like second second round yeah. of doing, like approach of doing music. But then, with with all of that being said, then you found yourself at the folk music department. Doing a masters, yeah. And in fact, there was there was accident that I practiced. It was something of two thousand and five. I practiced very much of like classical double bass, mm -hmm. and broke my hand. So oh. I was I was like I weren't able to practice properly in like I don't know two years after that. Ooh. So uh, I had to practice very less, and then I had time to just play long notes and very like it was this hand so i was i i had to concentrate on just being relaxed and think about the uh, movements and also playing yohiko because i wasn't able to play double bass so i played so much more yohiko on that time so on that time when i was i felt like i'm i'm dropping out of this kind of like uh fast-paced uh, classical uh, uh, studying so I felt like okay maybe it's not my path maybe maybe I just follow this folk music path so then I did this is like conscious decision that okay classical music f let's forget it let's co concentrate on only on folk music mm -hmm. so that's that's the one that that was the when I really was like get uh, got um omistautua that was the time when i really got addicted to mm. folk music and did i uh, uh, sorry cut <laughs> <laughs> okay and that was there's the no, moment there's no when... cut silka that was the that was the moment uh when i really dedicated myself to playing folk music mm. And content, concentrating on only folk music, and and for for you there, it was very much focused on the yohiko, or did you continue to just play every everything you've been playing so far? All it, 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 like it la last like ten years already. On two thousand and five, I I started concentrating on double bass. I think no, no, when I, I mean it. on your two years studies in the masters for the masters degree oh. in folk music. It, yeah. Were you focusing on the yohiko clearly? I, I did four years of masters there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I started 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 in Sibes Academy in two thousand and three, and now only three years. So I will have my twenty year celebration of being oh. uh, present every year. Okay. <laughs> so, but you're, yeah, you're uh, part of the furniture. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no. I, I was uh, concentrating mostly on uh, still on double bass. Okay. And uh, I got my first. I decided to get my first uh, yohik lessons when I got into folk music department. Okay. But there, there wasn't people who I felt that could give me the information what I needed. So I I ended up go to going to one uh viol player Vilda gamba player mm. in fact former Vilda gamba player who were uh, experts in medieval music especially oh, medieval music okay. and early, early 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 baroque so because of that that line i i have this kind of bow nowadays <laughs> and <laughs> got strings so okay. <clears throat> I, I was I was already on that time I was, I was quite deep in this uh, early music stuff and I felt that that could give me like more more 
inspiration and more po expressive possibilities to go, go deeper to the Gamba world, to the how how it uh, to the performance conventions and also about the technical possibilities and technical solutions of the instrument itself. Okay. So uh, when I was doing masters, it was quite like both that I was I was checking out uh, baroque stuff with double bass and trying to put them to uh, folk music, and then with Yohiko I was doing more like Renaissance stuff and medieval stuff and trying to think like how they resonate with uh, tr traditional Yohiko music. It's interesting because. I, I, I made the same approaches to people in the early music departments. Well, I wasn't studying music. So I was even a more an, an outsider going inside the university. Uh, or, I mean, you know, musicians know each other. And if you ask someone that knows someone, then you just phone that person and said, oh, so-and-so gave me your number, mm. and play bagpipes. And that normally opens a few doors because people are intrigued. Uh, yeah. Of course, they know nothing about bagpipes, but my in your case, you're going for the for the gamba player. In my case, I was looking for theoretical knowledge that could explain s stuff that no one was able to explain in the bagpipe world. Well, mm -hmm. when I say no one, of course, there's someone. There's actually several people that could explain it, but in my circle of pipers, it was very much a folk-oriented world that... Uh, doesn't care much for for theoretical framing of wh whatever you're doing, right? Um, yeah. For people listening to us in Portugal, there isn't a degree in folk music, so folk music is just a practice that uh, is quite alive. So uh, maybe because there's no fear of extinction, no one cares about studying it. Mm. Uh, maybe that's it. I don't know. But it, it, it hasn't come into the, into, the, to, into the academia yet. Jazz has already for a few decades and, and early music. So those would be maybe the door openers. I don't know if it was the same here in Finland. So how was your, how, how do you, how was the reception? Uh, well, you're, you're a, an odd bird, so you could speak both languages. You, would, you had a classical background. So it probably wasn't difficult, but how how is the Yohiko framed within the guys in the early music? Like, yeah, from the point of classical and early music, of course, it was it was freakish. And then then this hierarchy, like uh, in any case, it's folk instrument. And the, yeah, from their point of view, I'm I'm a folk musician, and uh, so it was. I think I that I was kind of a freak yeah. who were interested in these issues, but they were happily there has been also uh, quite many who have somehow got interested that hmm yeah. maybe this combination would be interesting. Yeah, or or even in a more open question, I guess. This, this whole uh, classical world, folk music world, jazz music world, rock music world, progressive music world, and so on. Um, would you agree that the most exciting fields are actually in the border lines or in the interceptions be between these worlds? Uh, yes and no. Mm. I would say that uh, if you are talking about musical cult cultures, then to express within one language, one has to have as a large vocal vocabulary mm. to give the information. So there's not that it's not that easy to have the vast vocabulary in uh, different fields of music. 
Yeah. So uh, that's that's one, and then understanding also the uh, musical structures profoundly in different cultures. So that's also quite difficult to have mm -hmm. together. Uh, so on the other hand, I. I I I don't I don't like fusion at all. Mm. Uh, it's it's something something if you are doing that for purpose it's always dangerous and it's somehow castrating many uh, all, all the musical culture somehow. Yeah. But that said, uh, for example, me I can't escape my history. That that my expressional tools, what I have, how do how I feel, how I want to express, uh, and what I want to express, the tools are from different sources. Yeah. So then, it just happened to be this kind of sources what I've had and what has been my interests. So then, then uh, it has to be somewhere there, on on the on the borders or getting across the borders yeah. because that that's that's the way I'm thinking that I, I see the connections between different cultures and make make them together because in my mind some of them they are united there is there is no this kind of musical uh, convention borders that okay you can't go there because that's folk music or that's something yeah. else but if you want to communicate, you have to be aware of these borders. That even though that you wouldn't bother thinking of them, there can be that your message can be ruined somehow if you don't take them to yeah. account. My, yeah, my my comment was more on that direction and not so much in a. Uh in creating new genres that come from fusion or or saying that the most excited projects was the was, were the ones that uh, were so exotic that needed new genres and that ends the you using the term fusion right it it was more to the fact that you want to practice a particular you, you want to have a particular practice and normally you in, you encounter gaps of knowledge and you ask around you and no one seems to, to be able to give you a solution and you often find a solution or find explanation from the mouth of someone that knows nothing about your field but that actually gives you the solution and that with me has hap happened often and the fact that you're saying oh i have this gut strings on my yohiko and i use this this bow so where did that come from then if not from the folk music world how did you encounter how did you come up with those solutions? So that, that would be a, an interesting question. Do you want to talk about that? Because yeah, yeah, that, that was during your master's, right? Yeah, that's, that's you already uh, answered your questions by your question by yourself that uh, if you, if you, uh, you, you are maybe thinking that there's some, some like pro problem here, but you can't focus, like, what is it? Exactly. And then you ask, for for example, in my case, from the retired gamba player, that how could I play how could I play better this instrument? I I, I knew that he didn't, don't know anything about yohiko. Yeah. And then he asked, like, why you are using so crappy bow? <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's true. I could try a different bow. So I then I I've been trying different bows and also developing this more traditional bow. Uh -huh. Also. Uh, because of the questions of this uh, Gamba teacher and uh, and also because of the historical facts that uh, there were a huge variety of different bows in already on eight, the 19th century in Karelia some were looking almost like this and some were looking much more uh, okay. tougher than this this is a beauty compared to <laughs> some so, yeah. Yeah. There, are, there, there is no one. There, there wasn't that clear tradition that the bow has to look like this. Let, let's let's go there, Ilka, because so for people that know 
nothing about this. Uh, so during your maturing as a musician, Yohiko started to, it, it, it was always there somehow, you know, even yeah. sometimes in the background. And then you just, you, you went for it during your master's stu uh, studies. And actually now you're doing a doctoral research with, with where the Yohiko is front and center, right? Yeah. So for people that are listening to us, um, what the hell is a Yohiko? And how, how do we come to find it in Finland? Yohiko is a boat lyre, mm -hmm. which has been played mostly, at least we have material from uh, the uh, from Karelia, Karelia area, which is uh, on the border area of Finland and Russia. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in uh, Estonian Isles has been another uh, place where it survived mm -hmm. until uh, 20th century. In there it was called Talharpa. Mm -hmm. There are also traces of the similar instrument from Sweden and Norway from the Middle Ages, but not, not really much information. The, the only information we have is from uh, Karelia and Estonian Isles. The, there are a few different shapes of the instruments and here is the quite traditional Karelian type of instrument but this is made by the master luthier Rauno Nieminen. Mm -hmm. uh, it normally had uh, got a horse hair strings or some had also got there on the strings mm -hmm. and the bow was more or less like looking like this and the sound the playing position was a little like here between your legs and it was dance instrument so it was mostly dance music so And the very special uh, technique here is that you press the string mm. by with the nail side of your finger. Yeah. And the older older instruments they had very small hole here, so they were really able to play only one string. But nowadays, these contemporary instruments you can have like. An <laughs> last string no with this instrument no okay but uh we have here also another instrument which is huh? the shape is reminding uh its close re close relation in estonian ones which had this like bigger hole here okay. a little different structure but this is combination of quite many different uh, uh, approaches yeah styles styles yeah because uh in estonia they were making the sides from the different wood and the bottom and the top but this is made in Karelian type from one wood and then top here and the top is like you can see it's carved it's okay. not it's not flat and by the way this is made by myself oh. in the okay. guidance of the master luthier where I tried all the things what we have been planning many years that very, very, it's very thin top and also the bo bottom yeah. and the carved top is also a specialty and also the, well, there's like four, there's four, four strings like in the Estonian instruments. Um, the Finnish instruments had many times two or three strings, but okay, okay. now we have here got strings and the tuning is I would say it's a fusion of Karelian and Estonian tuning. I 
see. And and you've been you've been barking at that tree for for many years now, and you embarked in this in this doctoral studies adventure. And you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah, I started started whole PhD like thinking that I have a hobby in my life. <laughs> and my okay. studying beside beside my freelance musician work. I was quite lots of doing like double bass gigs in world and folk music things on that time still. And originally my PhD plan had it it included uh, a double bass playing and play uh, playing double bass in a more like basso continuo or like baroque style mm. and combining the elements of uh, baroque accompaniment to the folk music world because uh, the convention of folk music accompaniment was from the popular music of mm -hmm. the last part of the 20th century but the music from, was from 18th century so it made sense to have this uh, elements from early music also in double bass and then I was learning uh, the uh, double bass viol or G by viol, violone, like it's called. And then Joik was only the third, one third of the whole whole original PhD plan. Oh, I see. But but I think uh, it quite 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 fastly it narrowed down to Joikko. That okay. I I would concentrate on that more. Well, only now it's only Yohiko. And I guess it has directed my thoughts also that there, there well there has been periods that I've been more again I I been still have been double bass player like mostly double bass player but still like I would say that I would say that my work is nowadays 75% at least or 80% uh, with Yohiko. Mm. But they are, they are like for example last last autumn there was a period that I played very much of double bass in and violone in baroque orchestras or smaller consorts but again still I guess Yohiko is like a virus it has it has it's it, like it has, pipes, mate yeah that's dangerous. that's dangerous and it it has it has occupied my my time quite well so that's that's the way also the research is now concentrated on only on so yohiko you you know about my research on the on the finnish sakipili on the on the finnish backpipe or better yet on on a a bagpipe that would have been played in the Finnish territories because mm -hmm. it would be a big discussion to discuss to discuss at this stage what makes it Finnish. But <laughs> let's say for the sake of argument that at one point it was known and it was played. We don't really know how or when or who or why. But mm -hmm. but I've been fascinated with this idea that the Yohiko might have some secrets to reveal or to what to someone like me that is looking for them or how would the bagpipe sound and what kind of music it would do firstly because you are dealing with drones mm. which is not that which doesn't doesn't make part of musical instruments that often and that's that's why i asked when you were demonstrating one of the yohikos I asked, can you reach the final string? And he said, no. Mm. So actually, either the, the string is there just to give you an extra note, or you can actually use it as a drone if you feel like it, right? Yeah. There's very sim many similarities. Like yeah. if the, in these instruments, the bridge is a little round, so I can play three uh, strings at the same time, but 
in some historical instruments and also with one of my other instruments I have complete flat, flat string so it's just like a, I have I can have three drones and mm. then one chanter there yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it's it's very similar similar and the other that's one thing the other thing is that we are both trying to achieve as perfectly as possible some kind of continuous sound mm. uh, right and for me that's the bag and for you it's it's the bow mm. Right? Mm. in a sense and that's also not something that most instruments aim to do so that's another interesting point then the, the sheer antiqu antiquity of the instrument but most importantly for me is the limitations because from what I've been gathering about bagpipes in the Baltic, um, we might be looking at a six finger hole, six finger hole bagpipe. Yeah, you know, and the drone, which uh, which take uh, takes us into the territory of of a modal instrument because the drone is there and rather limited, maybe one octave. Uh, and maybe not many semitones available, just a preset scale that that frames whatever music you're going to do, and the drum that immediately also frames it. Is that the case also with the yohiko, you think? Definitely, yes, because the traditional instruments, especially the Karelian instruments, it was six notes you were able to play, yeah. and that was all, plus then the drone there, Fifth, fourth below, mm. or fifth or fourth, depending on the string, because the tuning is this: the chanter, the mid drone, and the tonic there on the side. Okay. Uh, 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 yes, the instruments uh, had it had their limitations, <clears throat> but it has been also interesting that the, also the players want them to keep the limitations. Yes. It, it was also part of the style that even though that they would know how they would sing the tune different way, that if they, that for example, there's some f famous folk songs, which were some of the late Yohiko players from the, from the beginning of 20th century, <clears throat> they were singing some popular folk folk songs, but when they, it it sounded like everybody in Finland know them, but when they played them with Yohiko, it was complete different style, and it it was very special special modal style how they used the melody, and uh, that has been that has been my interest long long time now, that. Uh, it's about. It's not that much about the material, uh, like musical material, that we could like say that all the yohiko material is ancient, or you could follow that music to very early times. Mm. Uh, because of there, there has been Russian dances, Russian modern dances, Finnish folk songs, or then. Runo, runo songs or different kind of dances but it's about the style like what they have trying to get out of the instrument mm -hmm. there has been some kind of like I don't know has it been conscious or how conscious uh, decisions decision with the musicians in Karelia mm -hmm. how they have swapped the melodies to the to Yohik language Hmm. Because of the limitations, uh, hopefully because of like, the limitations, but because of the uh, es, uh, the aesthetics. aesthetics, what they had had there. You think almost like, and take take this with a grain of salt, but almost like, even if the repertoire is entering the instrument on one side, is coming the on the other, is coming out of the instrument as a filtered by the instrument itself in a way to the frame yeah, yeah. it's filtered also with bagpipes yeah yeah, yeah. filtered compressed 
and then it coming. It's like it can be vast material yeah. there, and then, yeah. and then comes yeah. this narrow like, line there. Do you think it's a little bit like a private joke almost that the the pipers or the Yohiko players are like into this joke, into this private joke where we know that that's the the style or that's 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 the way. Mm. Like, like glasses that you put a kaleidoscope like glasses you put and you see reality it's kind of fun we know to look at reality through that those lenses you think yeah yeah it can be yeah and yeah yeah, yeah and it's it's very very uh niche jokes that i i guess that they that everybody are not fascinated about this kind of uh jokes where you take uh all the colors and have them all. It's it's like having like in this time of uh, digi digital cameras, mm. you would have this like uh, needle eye camera. Yeah, pin, and pin say that This is cool, and yeah. because you get a nice rough picture there, which doesn't have any any proper qualities of the picture, but there is something special in it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I get you know I get the same with. Uh, uh, in bagpipes, uh, not on not every bagpipe, but on a number of bagpipes, we have a one note under the drum on our mm. chanters, right? So the question is always, is that note half a step under the drum or a full step under, under the drum? Mm. And that, or, or if it's, there's no note under the drum, so you never... The repertoire never goes there but mm -hmm. when there is a note and you play it in a different instrument it's kind of funny because everyone can recognize that it's if if it's it was supposed to be a semitone and now it's a tone now it's too deep it doesn't sound right you know and if mm -hmm. it's a, a full tone normally on that repertoire and you just playing a semitone then it's wrong you know and it's kind of laughable amongst us pipers when you do you're playing a repertoire that is recognizable but when you you hit that note it's wrong you know mm. so or or if it if oh for instance if 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 the bagpipe plays minor that particular bagpipe and you're clearly playing a, a major scale repertoire that belongs to another bagpipe then it's funny as well so that's yeah. that's the thing when repertoire enters an instrument and can, comes out the other way yeah, definitely, definitely. And yeah. like how, how it comes out there, that, that's also, I guess there's this personal choices and then there is this kind of conventional, uh, depending on the culture where the players were. Mm -hmm. But I, I had, there, there's very interesting uh, example of this. The tune, what I was saying, the song, what I was just referring a moment ago is very, very well known, this kind of, Kukukku kaukana kukku saimaan rannalla ruikuttaa. Ei ole ruhtaa rannalla, joka minun kultani kannattaa. Okay, there was A and B part. I didn't repeat that. Yeah. It's very, very famous. So, and then the, uh, two the last one of two last Johiko players we uh, what were recorded or in the beginning of 20th century. It was. Uh, 1914 when they were recorded they were from the neighborhood villages mm -hmm. the other one has had burned his instrument because he got religious and got religious yeah so, okay. so then <laughs> because this, this, this was purely sinful instrument <laughs> but uh when the uh ethnomusicologist come to record them then uh, the other guy who were religious already, he borrowed uh, the instrument from the other guy who was living in neighbor neighboring village, yeah. and they were playing just the same tune, the tune what I sang. In so the same instrument. A part, yeah, with the same instrument. Yeah. And the, uh, so the melody in A part goes like this: kukku uh, kukku kaukana kukku. So the first Yohiko player played like, played like this.
Wow, that sounds modal. But yeah. well, he was there quite quite right. But the drone just was a little shady there. He yeah. used that. It didn't matter what was the drone. Okay. It didn't matter what was the key there. He. There are many other other examples from him that he plays the melody. The melo minor melody, like with this string, uh, yeah, with the, this chanter string. But then uh, he just uses the drone, what he had, and it sounds quite modal then. Okay, and then the other guy uh, played that tune next, uh, next day. He was playing it like this. So he played like this. <laughs> it, it was also okay. quite different. And uh, there are one few things uh, what I've been thinking. Uh, one is that uh, this Master Luthier uh, who has who, Rauno Nieminen, who has doctorate from this uh, Jovico research, uh, like he has been doing research about the instrument and the structure and the, also the what uh, repertoire. He also made copies of this same instrument, what they used there, these two guys, and in the copy. It wasn't a, it, he, they weren't able to play low first there. So they had only So they both uh, solved this problem in uh, the problem how to how to follow the sang melody. They solved that in different way. The other one just played the melody in a way like chanter melody. And the other one thought, I want to have, this is my, just my thinking that maybe yeah. the other one thought that he wanted to have the drone, right? Yeah. It goes quite nicely here, but then he wasn't play, able to have the low first here. So the minor third didn't came out. So he had to just let. So, and of course, when they went to the B part, that da 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 da. They weren't play, able to play any of these notes, so uh, they had to. They both did own choices there. The other one played they, like they couldn't. They couldn't because the the hole was too narrow and they couldn't change the hand. Yeah, they weren't able to do this. What I was yeah. doing, okay. so they had to play with the one string. Yeah. So again, then uh, not not going deeper there. How they what they were doing there, but. Uh, as an example, it, it was like they both had to all the time rearrange the melodies uh, with their own distinctive style, how they got used to rearrange the melodies they heard or maybe they what they were asked to play when they were playing weddings. Yeah. So they were making all, all the time constant decisions that, okay, this is my way of doing it. Here's the melody. Okay, how do I play with this limited instrument? Mm -hmm. And they, they, they both had uh, clearly different approach to that. Mm -hmm. But still, they were like this kind of basic licks, what they still did with the instrument. There were some basic, basic lines, but they included in their rearranging of the melody. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's very interesting there, like, and what could be somehow connected with the backpipe material. That uh, again, it's not about the music in itself. It's about how the players, whether there's some kind of convention, whether there's some kind of tradition, how they converted uh, the melodies they were asked to play, which may may maybe weren't. Uh, backpipe or yohiko melodies, how mm. they how they converted them 
to this limited instrument. If it was you doing the Sakipili research, would you say that there could, we could make some kind of inferences from repertoire in order to get to the scale of the bagpipe? <laughs> uh, that's a tricky one. Uh, it's 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 very tricky one because I I'm thinking here that hmm, the evidence we have from bagpipes they are from the western side of the Finland, mm -hmm. isn't they? The churches, uh, the paintings. And uh, somehow it's related more to how to say Western world mm. and to the Eastern world. And how about is is what what kind of tradition is is this like what we have here with Yohiko the material and how to play with the drone? Mm. Is that how much is it affected uh, with this kind of like regional styles? Is it more Eastern or is it more Western or anything like that? Or does it even make sense? Do we have to think that at all? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't know <laughs> where to start with the, with the scale or with the melodies because like like with, with Jouhikko, um, well, they, they all had quite similar uh, scale, but I don't know, was it because of the... Uh, but that, that was the only scale that you were able to play with this instrument. Yeah. It, that can, can we derive, for example, backpipe uh, scales from this, what the people played in the, in the beginning of 20th century, which is quite far away. Yeah. From the goal, on oh, the goal. Yeah, what have happened there on the meantime? So, yeah, it's quite difficult that uh, because yeah, you have to decide it. So, mm. Mm. of course, I would I would go to uh, I would start to think like what what kind of. Um, melodies we have on Pie Cantiones collection, mm -hmm. which is from the late 16th century. The first, first like, uh, written down music. Oh, well, in written down music in Finland, of course, the music in that collection, uh, it's, it's from all over Europe, mostly. Mm -hmm. But there are also some, some uh, songs which haven't, which haven't been able to uh, connect to any other uh, older older version of, of the mm. melodies, so it can be like played only in Finland area, or the, the area which is now Finland. But uh, so it, I I would think that to combine. Uh, church, church, church uh, paintings, and uh, the earliest manuscript, which is mostly above, above, sang by uh, to be priests, mm. it would make it would make sense to think like what could in what kind of music there is and how it would be possible to play yeah. with that. We're, we're, we're reaching an hour here, and mm -hmm. as usual, uh, yeah. it goes fast. And before we go, um, first of all, thank you again, because this whole idea of the podcast, you're, you're in a sense, you're part of this, because you are crazy enough <laughs> to accept to be uh, the first interviewee, the first guest, mm -hmm. and also to, to test uh, the recordings and the sound and everything you've, you've been really um, really nice so 
be, before we go, and well, I we shouldn't speak about the quarantine or anything like that, like like that, because we are all unfortunately uh, very much aware of it. So, where do you see these conversations going with other researchers and and um, where, how does this help or contribute to the discussion of folk music, to, to doctoral researches? What, what, what do you think? Because we are two odd examples. I haven't spoke about my, we haven't spoke much about my example this time, but we spoke about yours. And it's, it's odd in a upside down world it's odd because for me it seems uh, obvious that some would, would be introduced and develop themselves in the music world the way you did mm. it's only in an upside world that we found your example strange right mm. so how do you think these conversations especially to people that are wondering should i become a musician i think examples like yours and conversations like the one we had today could help but what do you think? Mm. Uh, from the research point of view, I think this kind of conversation can open up uh, uh, the knowledge and the awareness of how we are uh, affected with the conventions around us, where we have grown up and how it affects us and what kind of decisions we made unconsciously or we at least thought that we are making them also consciously mm. uh, and also uh, when we, we we didn't have time to put very well side by side these two instruments but yeah. i guess yeah. they would have we would go to this point that we don't have so much like evidence that we could say that this kind of like bullet proof evidence of how mm. it has been played it's about thinking about the methodology how we recreate these instruments and what are the methods in recreating the sound recreating the uh, instrument in itself and i guess we would have been going to there and i think that's uh, the main interest at least for many in research mm. well, and also then we go to this there's this side product that you have to questionize what's nationality and yeah. uh, how can what can we relate to any of these like the whole idea of folk music for example like we know it's complete bullshit that there is hasn't been folk and there has been just music and there hasn't been any like this kind of nationalistic thing it's so brand new there has been just tribes and different villages which have their own styles different purposes but that's that's that big that's so huge issue so let's, let's <laughs> I, I was thinking if if but, if the idea was not to get controversial <laughs> that's out the window <laughs> no but i i agree at least I agree with the with the need to have that discussion, mm -hmm. and and to be and to be okay with it. Yes, uh, it, but, but I guess identity it, is a is a is a huge mm. um, cloud mm. that I think we must endure our life uh, all our lives. For instance, mm. um, we started this conversation with you cracking a very interesting joke, which when I said. Uh, well, you you were very nice to come and talk to me during the the reception of the doctoral students, and you answered, "Well, maybe it's strange, in, like something like that." The, the joke was along the lines of, "Well, maybe it's strange in Finland, right?" <laughs> yeah, so in yeah. a sense, you're making like this identity your joke, right? That has yeah, yeah, to do that, with the that, perception of who we, we are, and where yeah. are the differences and and uh, and the bridges, and that's 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 really nice. Mm. But um, in fact, I think uh, that that was about the identi identity tools that we had. That well, the Finnish are like that, and the Portuguese are like that, and we can we can be conscious of them, or then we just want to keep tight them and not 
just put the stereotypes more there. So I don't know. That's 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 about folk music also that uh, people are uh, uh well they want to keep the stereotypes because for the whole phenomenon of folk music, it's about stereotypes. <laughs> it's about <laughs> dead stereotypes. Mm. So. Yeah, okay, now I'm a little too controversial already. <laughs> but, uh, and, we are, and today we're not drinking, so... <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, maybe not, 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 not like that, but uh, still like the whole idea of this kind of national music and regional music. Hmm, I don't know. But about the, the other question that... Uh, what, what the people who are planning to be musicians of playing folk music, I would say that I, I would think I would hope that we could help people thinking another routes that you can you can you can be a musician in in many many different ways and you can get the different points with many different routes like like me that I'm I've been like but um, Oh, I was all, almost like 15 years, like mostly freelancer musician as a double bass player. And before that, I thought that I will be a classical, classical, classical double bass player. Before I was playing mostly rock. Yeah. And, and now I'm here in this dark room talking about Jouhikko and recording only that most of the days. So, uh, and they all are reasonable ways to do music. And they just and at least we are lucky pastors in Finland that we can even get some money out of it. <laughs> As in some cases, if you are just can, if you just are, you you have guts and ass enough to write enough grant applications. Yeah. Well, my friend. Thank you so much uh, for this hour and something of wonderful conversation. And uh, I think we will hear more about it in the near future, because I yeah. think this whole podcast business should, should go forward. Yeah, definitely. It's a very good idea for you. And uh, I would say also our discussion here, it, it was just a, a scratch. Yeah, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the real point of discussing about the, about the instruments and about the repertoire and the historical context and also the conventions and everything. He opens, he opens up the, the discussion, I guess. That's, that's an important thing. And, and I think Controversy is also important. It's 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 again identity. It's important for people not to be upset, um, hmm. because we can always change our minds if we discuss it enough, and if we open the subject enough. It's it's not like we have to agree, um, especially at first. I think it's hmm. it's much better when we do not agree at first. Hmm. Um, but again, thank you. And I'll, I, I will see you very, 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 very soon. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Guys. And then we can actually, after that, we can have a proper debate because from that point onwards, we don't have to. And, and maybe, maybe we'll have a proper debate soon. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, okay. <laughs> You enjoyed yes. that? Yeah, that was good.